and hydrangeas. Let me just quickly discuss the format of today's presentation. Um, we are going to cover these slides. There's a lot of good material to cover. So Linda is going to be going through some of the information with us at different kinds of hydrangeas and some information on how to plant the hydrangeas in the best soil and some other conditions. Um, if you do think of any questions, the best way to put them in right now is in the chat window. The chat function is on the bottom of your screen and we'll start looking at those questions and at the very end of the presentation we'll start addressing your questions one by one and we'll have a more interactive session where we can chat with Linda. And I hope that makes sense for everybody so we'll go ahead and get started. Okay so I, I fell in love actually I fell in absolutely love with hydrangeas in France. I mean but you know a long time ago when I was a little girl the classic statement that was when the people would plant a plant in a house you know like you had a house built right after World War II you had a hydrangea and I of course I was quite small and I, I didn't have anything about this but know anything about plants really at that point and so but when I started going to France all the time I saw them and so the tent the intense color and the beauty of the blooms uh, I mean just absolutely astounded me so whenever I would come back I first started buying Michael Durr's book Michael Durr is the guru of all hydrangeas in the Georgia area and not just Georgia everywhere he is the he's well known everywhere for what he does with plants and so I started with just three plants with Annabelle which is a native hydrangea within the um, southeastern United States I did not know that at the time that I purchased it but every southern garden that has got a hydrangea usually has an Annabelle um, it is just a classic and then I put in a triangle area I put two other plants uh, two merits beauty and they were dark dark purple I mean just purpley pink and so you had the white at the top and you had your triangle at the bottom the base and when you would approach it from the side you would see all of those colors and it was just breathtaking and um so then I became addicted you know I started you know going on into the different varieties so you can go to the next slide <laughs> okay Okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about this. Now, you have your Annabelle that's a native, you have your Quercifolia, which is an oak leaf that is a native. And um, so these are the base of many grafts that are made into making new plants that perhaps are new, more hardy or more the, the stems are stronger or their blooms are a little bit different. And so, um, but, but basically most people that have a garden that is large enough to handle a, um, a quercifolia, a, a, you know, you will have one. And then the same goes for the Annabelle. So, but, but the other types of hydrangeas were discovered in the East. And so you would say Japan, you could say Thailand, you, you could say anywhere. So those started with, you know, the, it, and pretty much every plant that we have starts in the Eastern part of the world. So um, the, the word hydra, I'm, I'm big, since I was a language teacher, I'm very big into what does a name mean. So hydra means water and gion in Greek means a vase or pitcher or something. So if you think about the, um, the, the shape of a hydrangea, it is a vase shape for the most part. You know, it goes up from its bottom and then it's got its big leaves and big stems that come up. So hydra, water, pitcher, water, vase, you know. So the hydra part is it, it gives you the idea that a hydrangea has got to have a lot of water. And the back of a hydrangea, the back of the leaf of the hydrangea, is it consistently full of tiny, tiny, tiny little holes. And I will not bother you and bore you with the, the name but because you won't remember that. But if you just think that the back of the plant is constantly emitting mist all the time, it's emitting mist, therefore, 
it needs more water on the base so that it can continue to dement that. And so if it's got a, um, you know, you see the, the, the limbs are not the limbs, but necessarily the uh, leaves drooping down, that just means that they have just got out, you know, they need a little taste of water, okay? So, um, okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna, this is the agenda. We're talking about varieties, the care, issues that you might have, pruning, propagation, and I hope that you enjoy this presentation. So if we talk about um, the varieties that you might have, now this is a, a large amount that you might be overwhelmed with whenever you go to a store, because what you see when you go to a nursery is color and, and the size of the plant, or there's got to be something that is attracting you to that. It might be the blossom. Um, so right now we're going to talk about the different varieties so the macrophylla is the french variety that is the ball-shaped bloom it's round it's big it's very colorful um, sometimes the colors can last on it for a very long time the quercifolia is the native oak leaf hydrangea and as i said earlier they that the blossoms can either stand up straight and they're generally always white. Now, I mean, you, it's very rare that you're going to find a quercifolia that is a different color. I know that there are some new varieties, but they haven't been like the standard, um, the, the native where your, 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 your blooms are stronger and they're white and they will stand up straight. Um, there is another variety of the quercifolia that will be panical, it'll hang down straight. And it is just gorgeous too, but it is a native also. The paniculata is, is a wonderful variety and it is becoming more and more interesting to the public, I think, because it is, it's one that won't be hurt by all of our freezes, the late freezes that we have. And it also blooms later than the macrophylla does. But, um, and, and they can be variegated in color. They can be, um, they can be all white, like a limelight, but they are, um, they, they are just really hardy plants. They require more sun <coughs> than our, our macroph macrophylla does. <laughs> Need to determine whether a customer is Medicare eligible. As the agent, your job is to direct the conversation. Are you eligible for Medicare or is there anyone in your household? On Do you hear that? I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> we'll just go on. Um, the arborescence um, this is a smooth leaf hydrangea. A smooth leaf is like an Annabelle. So the Annabelle, as I said, is what is used basically to graft new plants from. And um, the Annabelle is a, a pretty much, you know, everybody knows what an Annabelle is. They've grafted onto that this year, um, or not just this year, several years ago, the <clears throat> Incredible, which is essentially the same plant as the, Incre as the um, Annabelle. However, it has better stems on it. And so that goes back to telling you that when they graft from a native, they're trying to improve anything within that native. So whether it's the size of the bloom, the quality of the bloom, the length of the bloom, the strongness of the plant, etc. The uh, Animola is a climbing hydrangea, and the climbing hydrangea leaves a little bit to be desired as far as I'm concerned. Uh, at my age in my life, I, I've had one, and it was about 40 foot tall, and it, it had it was up a tree. And then when we had our um, drought, a really severe drought several years ago, it began to die just in pieces. You know, it started at the top and it would just have a hunk that would die off of it. Just kept on going down, so finally I lost it. I do have a piece left that is coming up, but um, probably in my lifetime, I'm not going to be able to see that thing bloom. Um, the, the blooms on an animola are different than the blooms on even a, um, a, um, 
serrata or a lace leaf or a macrophylla, they tend to be more airy and they don't last very long. They look like, uh, kind of like when they begin to dry, they look like little straw flowers. Um, um, so in, for me, now that doesn't mean for you, that just means for me, I want something that's going to be able to produce well. There are many, many, many varieties of the climbing hydrangea, and perhaps you might be able to select one that will be more successful than what mine was. But um, I don't know. I can't really attest to that. The serrata is also a wonderful plant in the fact that it is um, it, it, it is like um, a little mini um, tiny little teacup macrophylla and and um, and it can also be a um, looks like a lace cap it's very you know has a big variety in the way it looks but it's a wonderful plant and um, so we'll go to the next slide mm -hmm. okay so now then this is what confuses most people when you say well what does old wood mean and what does new wood mean and what does remontant mean and so forth and so i'm going to try to explain all this to you today I mean, you might know all of this already, but I'll try to zip right through this, okay? So when it says it blooms on old wood, which is what most, most all macrophyllas do, and oak leaves do, they bloom on old wood. That means that any growth that you have had in this particular growing season is what will bloom next year. And so you have to think about that. That is a huge component about when you prune something. Because if you prune something at the wrong time, you're pruning off all of your uh, blooms for next year. And you don't know that, of course. I mean, you can't see that at all. But um, that's, that's what happens. Um, they can be large, four to eight foot tall, sometimes even larger than that. It just depends upon your variety. The French, you know, type of, I've talked about French mop heads, ball shaped, the lace caps are disc shaped, and they are so pretty because they have this, this little, it's like a little dish, and in the center of that dish, they have all of these little teeny weeny little things that will open up, and all the butterflies and the bees come to that to, to you know, get their nectar, etc. And then on the exterior of it, you have little blossoms that will be various colors. And when they are through pollinating, then all of those blossoms turn over upside down, and then you know that it's through with its duties in the garden, but it still has a very pretty look about it. The remontant means, monte in French, monte in French means to go up. All right, re meaning to re, it's like in English. So you have re going up, re mounting, re blooming is what this would be. The thing is that most people, when they see that, they think, okay, I'm going to have blossoms all summer long. I'm going to have blooms all summer long, just like I would in June. That is not the case, and I don't want to discourage you from having these because they're wonderful plants, but you, you need to understand that what that means is that it takes it 90 days on new growth. So when it push up, pushes up another stem from, you know, an old stem, let's say, it pushes up that growth, then it's going to bloom, but it takes it 90 days to do that, and that's that's pretty much the end of the summer. That's why you see right now many hydrangeas that will be having new growth and new blooms that will be coming out on it. I don't think that, I think the beauty about the remontant is that you can have blooms later on. You can have, uh, but it protects you as a gardener from having a total wipeout <laughs> If we have a, a uh, like a, you know, April, after April 15th, when we've had been noted for having all of these terrible freezes that we've had come in, which um, in, in, you know, March, late March, 1st of April, you start having the swelling of the buds and the little bitty leaves start coming out. And then we have these freezes that kills everything. But a remontant will be able to recover and you will be able to have some blooms later in the season. 
And um, so uh, the, the bloom struck is what you see in everybody's garden. And that's in the upper left-hand corner, what you see. And that is my garden. And I will tell you, it blooms its head off. It is a strong bloomer. Uh, it's beautiful. It can have different colors on the plant. Um, it is hardy. And I have never, ever had a season that it has not bloomed. I mean, it always blooms. On the bottom, you have a lace cap. The lace caps are beautiful. This is a lady in red, but most people are confused when they say lady in red because sometimes in some gardens it can be blue, sometimes it can be pink. It is never red. And, and but the thing, the name comes from the stem. The stem has a red stem on it. Uh, on the upper right hand corner is a new variety that's called City Line and they are, well, I would have to say this, let me preface this. There are, in my garden, I have had success with three. One has been struggling, but I think that just maybe it didn't like where it was planted. And so I have moved it this year to another garden. But it is at this particular one this year, this, this picture that you see there is from last year. This year, the color on it was absolutely dark, dark purple. I've never seen it bloom like that before, where it's been that dark purple before. The bottom is Fuji Waterfall. That is from my yard also. And Fuji Waterfall is on these tiny, tiny little thin uh, stems that burst out and it looks just like a star flying out from the plant, uh, like a waterfall would be going. And I've heard some people say that it looks like starburst, but, and it might be, you know, that sometimes these varieties are very, very similar. Okay. All right, Aquarisifolia. All right, so in you see two pictures here. The third on the on the left hand side of the picture is Ruby Slippers, and Ruby Slippers I have heard has got uh, varying you know, varying various types of um, re, you know reports. Some say it's great, some say it's not, some say it never turns purple like that. So. I do not have that plant. It is a smaller version of a Quercifolia. So it has been grafted from a, a native plant. And, um, but, you know, I, you know, the verdict must be still out on that. Now, at the top right hand side is an Alice. I have that at the top of my bed, up at the very, very top. I, you, you need to prune these after um, they finish their blooming, and, and that can be, you can see really quickly on an Alice, on, on a Quercifolia, whether it's time to prune because it starts putting up new growth immediately. The bottom picture on the, on the right is called Snowflake, and Snowflake is, an, um, is a native itself. It has not been grafted. It was discovered in Alabama, of all places. And if you notice on the very far right hand corner, that is the length of that uh, blossom. And at the, I mean, it is from the tip of my fingers to my elbow. It is enormous. And it's a very, I mean, stunning plant in the garden. And um, it will, um, you know, it just stands down. So you've got an example of standing up the pictures and standing down. So I have three oak leaves in my, my garden. One is Alice, one is, um, uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the other one's name and, and this snowflake. And um, so there you go, okay. All right, so now then we're going to talk about paniculatas. Paniculatas, everybody pretty much anymore thinks about a paniculata as being a limelight. They'll say, okay, I've got a limelight, that's a paniculata, which it is, of course. Uh, and um, paniculatas bloom on new wood. So that means in February about, January even, um, if it's really cold, when they're totally um, down, you know, any new, no, no growth at all on it. You can cut those, you can prune those at that point. So any growth that you have coming up the next year is what you're going to be having your blooms on. And um, so they can become enormous, just like a quercifolia can. I mean, the limelight in particular can get immense. Mine is probably, oh, I would say 10 foot tall, probably. And it, it, this is your picture on the left-hand corner is that is my paniculata that I have. 
Next to it, which you really can't tell, is the vanilla strawberry or strawberry vanilla on it. And um, it blooms white, white, whereas this is more of a um, greeny white, I guess, is the way to describe it. Um, it blooms later in the season. It is, um, the blossoms can be upright or they can be sort of dangling to the side. Um, they are one of the largest ones that has the biggest panicles is um, Pinky Winky. And it is just absolutely stunning. I have one and I have it on the side of my garden. It gets pretty much full sun all the time. And I'm not kidding you. I think the blossoms on it that stand straight up are like 15 inches tall. That, and it is pink, dark, dark pink on the bottom and just a little white on the top. Um, a friend, my neighbor next door has three pinky winkies that are get more shade and they do not take that color. They don't have that color. And um, I think that's very important to know about panicles. They have got to have sun. And um, so let's, we've got some examples, some other examples. Here are some examples of them. So this is a PG on the left and a PG is extremely hardy. I have one at my lake house in Alabama. Um, many of you might see a PG being um, a, a tree, you know, in a tree farm. Um, but they, they turn a very pretty color in the fall, kind of a rosy color all over. They're very, very hardy though. Next is the little lime. Now I will have to say on the right hand side at the top, I would have to tell you that I think the verdict is also out on the little lime. Um, it is, I don't think that it has been as um, good of a plant as they hoped at the beginning. The first couple of years, I mean, I've three years, I would say I had great success with it, but this last year it just started, you know, saying I'm not happy and um, I think I'm going to die. And, and so it has been, um, I mean, it's, it did bloom, a few blooms, and <clears throat> I accused my husband of trying to kill it, but I, I don't, you know, I, he said, I'm, I'm not guilty of that. So uh, on the left-hand side is quick fire and quick, this is little quick fire, not big quick fire. This particular one is little quick fire. Little quick fire is small. Um, it has dark purple stems on it. And that's what kind of makes it really interesting is the stem that you see. The, on the right hand side is Bobo. Now you will see documents on Bobo as being only two to three foot tall. Believe me, mine is six foot tall. And it is a stunning, stunning plant. But where I have it planted, it is at the bottom of a deck. And so I think that it gets a lot of water flushing down that hill. And so that makes it just be stronger, but it is covered covered every year in blossoms and it is just beautiful i mean tiny little dainty lacy like blossoms but it looks very much just like that picture except it's much larger you know okay all right so the arbor uh, uh, arborescence is um is the annabelle all right so what you see is the annabelle on the top right hand side now the Annabelle blooms on new growth, as does the Incredible and the, and the Spirit that you see, these three pictures, as does Bobo. Bobo blooms on new growth too. But I want to talk, we'll talk a little bit about pruning these in a moment. Um, <clears throat> the Annabelle, if you have an Annabelle or you're thinking about buying an Annabelle, just know that you have to support that plant for you to be able to have all summer long um, stems that are not going to be broken. They can, they're very, very pliable and they will be broken by a, not broken, but bent, let's put it that way, by a strong wind that will come because their, their blossoms are so large that they will, you know, they, they bend, they blow. And so the stem is not strong enough to hold the blossom and it bends over. Uh, they, they do dry extremely well. As I said earlier, um, you can pretty much cut them at the end of the season and then you can have a really nice bouquet of dried flowers within your home. 
my daughter takes them and she ties a pretty bow around the bottom of them and puts them in a crystal lace and um and they look great you know the incredible is a graft from the in, uh, the um annabelle and the incredible is really pretty much the same plant except it has strong strong limbs and it can they can they can just handle pretty much any kind of wind that you might have coming through. Now, if you're chomping, tromping through your garden and you hit a limb and step on it, of course, it's going to bend over, but basically it's quite good. And the, as I said earlier, if you notice that the um, blooms on the Annabelle are real dainty looking, very, very tiny, little dainty things. And Incredible is just a little bit bigger, a little, little, not rough, but you know, just a little stronger bloom than this daininess. Now I had an invent, this spirit, Invincible Spirit, and I, this, this particular plant requires more sun than any of the others. And I gave it to a friend of mine because it was not blooming in my yard. And um, if they don't bloom, they have to move. And, and so I, um, I, she gave it to, I mean, I gave it to her and it is absolutely beautiful in her yard. So it's in the right, you know, right culture. So next year. Okay, so here we have the animola, and here is an example of your hydrangeas that that believe me, they are slow to bloom. Don't be don't be surprised at ten years. I mean, it would take it ten years to bloom. If you move it often, it takes it even longer because it has to readjust to its you know area. And some people say, well, one year to get acclimated, two years to grow, three years to bloom. Well. I think that this one that, you know, it takes it a little bit longer. And if you've had more success with it than I'm telling you, more power to you, I, I would say. I mean, that particular photo is a gorgeous photo, but um, I, have, I would have to say to you that the length of the bloom does not warrant the time that you have to spend with it. And I'm sorry to have to say that, but that's my opinion. Okay. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so okay, so the mountain hydrangea is a serrata. Okay, so you have this is preziosa. Preziosa is an old, old plant, and it is just beautiful. But the the, the blooms that you see there are exact. They mostly bloom pink, and they are like a teacup size, and they are really, really pretty. I mean, I bought that. My first plant I bought from Wilkerson Mill and um, it took it, uh, you know, maybe a couple of years to really kind of get itself going where it bloomed all over. And boy, it is now just real happy where it is. And um, it's just a pretty plant. At the top, you will see my hand, top right hand, and I'm holding this tiny little picture that of this this bloom. This is a mountain hydrangea also, and mountain hydrangeas are tend to be uh, more cold hardy, but their blossoms are tiny and more like um, a, just a little bitty, little bitty teacup. And um, but they're real pretty. Uh, they look kind of like a lace cap in a way that they have this furry part in the center. A uh, tiny tough stuff is really good. It is tough and it looks like a um, lace cap, um, but but it's not. I mean, it's, you know, serratus can be classified also as a lace cap, but it is a nice plant, a very strong plant and blooms well, blooms well. Okay. Okay, so now that whenever you're thinking about this, this is when you go into, this is the danger that you always have. One time when I went into a garden and I was uh, talking to this man about hostas and I was just like this child in a candy store and I was going in and I said, oh my God, I love that one and that one and that one, you know, and he said, take a 30 foot step back and look, can you tell the difference between this plant to that plant? And so that is what you really need to think about when you're going into your garden, not necessarily to, um, the leaf like in a hosta, but in the size of the plant, read the labels and understand that label is, um, can be deceptive sometimes. I mean, you just have to understand that. Most macrophyllas and, and lace caps prefer 
high, high shade. And so they can take morning sun that comes through, they can take a little bit of dappled afternoon sun, but they all, every plant needs sun to bloom. It just means the, the quantity of sun that you give it. And um, so we're talking about macrophyllas here, not panicles, macrophyllas. And um, so you need to think about the size. How large is your garden? Um, are you wanting to put um, one, maybe say, as a focal point and plant others around that? Or do you want to incorporate that into um, a, um, you know, other types of plants that will, um, you know, offset the time that you don't have blooms on your plant? Now, remember that a, a, that a hydrangea is deciduous. That means it loses all of its leaves in the wintertime. A lot of people do not like that. They're not going to do that because it is deciduous. They're not going to buy one because of that, even though they might like the color and everything else. But what you can do to hide that to, in, you know, the visual look of it is to plant evergreens behind the plant. And, and that gives you that they just kind of disappear in the winter. You just see your evergreen plant. You just, maybe you will think that's a small tree or something coming up. You know, I, I, I've never found that to be a problem for me. It's not, uh, but you can do that. Okay, so soil is by far the very most important thing that you can do in your garden. I mean, I, I my mother always used to say to me, Linda, spend 10 cents on a plant and a dollar on soil. And so the, the most important thing when you are getting your beds ready for planting, I don't care really what kind of a plant it is, you've got to have good soil. And so the, I always say, you, I mean, there are several things that you can do. Some of us who, um, you can go to a large, um, like let's say, and I'm not trying to push Green Brothers, but you can go up to Green Brothers and you can buy a product called Flower Mix. And Flower Mix is wonderful. It has a lot of things that are, you know, within the plant, <clears throat> pardon me. But um, you can mix that with like soil conditioner and sand, and you can put some wet peat moss within that. And so you've got this little bitty or big, whatever you're going to do, mud pie, if you want to call it that. You have mixed all of these different elements together to make your soil correct. So you, in, in digging the area that you are wanting to plant your soils in, your, your plant in, take some of your native soil and mix that within that because that native soil is going to give it an inoculation for disease. It is going to make it, it's like a preventing it from becoming sick. And I've always tell people, don't just plant it in a hole with all this because you've got to have the whole scenario together and um, they will just do wonderful. Now, a lot of people make a mistake if they use um, peat moss, you, you, but some people put it in dry. You cannot do that because if you put peat moss into your, your soil dry, it is going to suck every piece of water and humidity that you have into that to get wet. You have to wet it in advance, mix it with all of your soils, and then put it in there. I mean, it's a wonderful product, but you cannot put it in dry because it will kill, kill, kill your plant immediately. Okay. All right. So next slide. All right. So now then fertilization. I this is what I do. Now I have a compost area that I use with chopped leaves and um, I mean I have a turner, you know, it's a big turning thing. I have chopped leaves and then I use my green peels from inside of the house from, you know, peels from apples and potatoes, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So by the end of September, and that's a whole year that I would have had this in there, that I would have been working on this. It is so ready to go into the garden. And I mix that soil with all of the worms that I have in there with soil conditioner. And then I just put it in a um, my wheelbarrow and I just go around in my garden and I put about two cups around each of the plants. You can put it on the drip line, it, you know, just get it in there. And the worms do the rest of the business for you. 
Um, then in January, I put two, two th I'm sorry about the phone. I, I don't know who that my husband's downstairs. I'm sorry. Um, the, in January is or February, January, February, it just bands late January when everything is really cold, you know, take some cow manure and then you put two to three cups um, on your plant around that base again. Um, and it would be, um, you know, it kind of, it's an organic, so it's really slow release. And then your March is when you begin to fertilize. And a, a hydrangea does not need a great deal of fertilizer. It needs very little, really. It gets most of it from the ground that you've got it planted in. But um, I use Michael Durr's formula of putting one tablespoon of 10, 10, 10 to every width and height. So if it's four foot wide and three foot tall, it's seven tablespoons. And that's all you put. You don't put any more. You don't do anything else until next year. And now sometimes in the midsummer, if we've had a terrible, terrible summer, maybe I might put maybe a half of a tablespoon on a plant and just give it a little boost. On the remontant, you can do that. You can put a tablespoon uh, every month, really, to give it that energy to push up another bloom because they do require a little bit more. But that's kind of iffy. You don't have to do that. I mean, it's, it's not required, but that's okay. I mean, I think it's good for the plant personally. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Okay, so watering. This is a big problem because, of course, today we've had this deluge of plants that we have, and um, a hydrangeas need a lot of water, but it's like one inch per week. Now, that is, you know, if we have rain, you don't have to worry about that, do you? I mean, if you've got a good, if you've had a good rain, let's put it that way. Um, it's best to water them under their foliage versus on top of their foliage. You water it on top of the foliage. Now, of course, I know that rain is going to be coming down here, but you that tends to make the plant have more of these black spots that get on the ends of the, the leaves during, the, especially during the latter part of the summer. Um, and it's like a fungus and it's very hard to control. So the best way to deal with it is to lay a water hose, a drip line, a water hose, a water sprinkler, anything under the plant and deep, deep water, and I mean deep water, um, until that, you know, so that it, it really, really gets way down into the plant. Um, you don't, whenever, uh, hydrangeas are typical of wilting in the afternoon and heavy sun, you know, late in the afternoon, um, but you don't really have to water those. You think, oh my gosh, I need to run out and water that plant. You don't really have to do that because um, unless the next morning you wake up and you look at that same plant and it's all wilted and then you need to get the water to it. Um, but otherwise, you know, one inch a week is fine. Okay, people want to know about color change. Okay, so go to the, you go to the nursery and you see one that is pink and you want it to be pink and you bring it home and you put it in the ground and it turns blue or it turns purple or whatever color it might be. It's not what you want it to be. And so in order for you to know what you're, you've got to go, you've got to take some soil test. Go to your general agent, you know, in um, whatever area you live in. And there are soil test bags and you can, I mean, it's very, very cheap to get a soil test and you can find out what your soil is for the area that you want to plant your plant. Now, if you want to maintain the color of a specific plant, you can put it in a container and it pretty much will hold that color. Um, so if it's pink when you buy it, you put it in a container, it probably is going to be pink the following year. Um, now, acidic makes blue, you know, alkaline makes pink, and then the neutral comes out a purple. And <coughs> some of the new varieties, like the City Line series, will hold their color even if they're in the ground. It's kind of a, a new thing, phenomena that is coming on anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I will say that um, I read an article one time about a gentleman who 
his his goal was to I mean he he loved to collect hydrangeas, and um, he would go out you know every week and he'd come home with like fifty hydrangeas and he would be uh, planting these and giving reports back to the um, growers to what was good and what wasn't necessarily good, et cetera, et cetera. And he said he made, he said he didn't like to prune his hydrangeas, nor did he like to try to change the color of his hydrangeas. And the reason for that was he said, I nearly killed the poor things the first year I tried that by putting too much of the lime or too much of the acid on the plant. And he said, so I let mine do whatever they want to do. And I would have to say to you, that is exactly what I do. And I'm going to describe my bed to you where it is. And I have probably one that is 50 foot long and um, maybe say 20 foot wide. Okay, so let's just give that as a ballpark figure here. So the outside of the edge is my yard. So it's grass. The top of that oval shape is pine straw. The sides of the other side are gravel. And so, and then, you know, the, the oval is grass that goes down on the bottom side. So the outside edge blooms pink. The inside is blue and the outside is purple. And so I, I could never figure that out until I realized that the runoff from the gravel was causing the neutral part to be purplish. And um, so that's what was explained to me whenever I had a landscaper come in and talk to me about it. Um, well, not a landscaper, but a friend within the Master Partners. But anyway, um, it just depends. I like a kaleidoscope of colors in my garden. Some people want that swath of um, all the same color, and which is outstanding, believe me, it is. And maybe that is for that person's personality. I truly, truly believe that every garden mocks the personality of the person that is designing it. It is not the landscaper's garden. It is your garden. And so however you want to make it is what you need to do. And so, okay, so next. All right, so any kind of, uh, hydrangeas are pretty hardy. I mean, they don't have, there is one particular thing that is happening currently that I will describe to you, but sometimes they can get thrips, and I had thrips last year that got onto the plant, and what ha happens is we had all of this water, and then we had a lot of heat, and it was just perfect conditions for a thrip to come in and get on the back side of the leaf and suck all of the good stuff out of that leaf and it became disformed and um you just have to spray with a fun uh, with an insecticide for you know thrips white flies i have never had a problem with white flies on my pants powdery mildew um i have had one time one issue with powdery mildew mm -hmm. and um after that i've never had any more but the only reason i had it was because i moved this immense plant in the middle of the summer and i was trying to keep it watered all the time and it just you know got powdery mildew all over it and but it survived and it's huge now so um black spot as we've already discovered and talked about the only way that you can treat that is by using a fungicide on it because it is a fungus and then under the leaf, spraying it under the leaf, not on top of the leaf necessarily. And, but, but the whole thing, you know, when you're doing that. Um, deer, of course, love the buds. They don't necessarily love the stem so much of the hydrangea, but they do like those buds. And um, <laughs> I use a product um, that is called Liquid Fence. There is another one called Plant Skid that is quite good. Um, I've used Bobex before, but for me personally, I have found that liquid fence works extremely well. And um, because it is, if you spray it around your perimeter, just like you would a fence, and then go back and spray all of your plants. If you follow the directions, just like they say, you will not have any problems. I mean, you know, every now and then you might, but you know, um, Basically, I think ground squirrels are more of a nuisance than anything. I think they, I have a colony probably in my backyard. I mean, they like to burrow underneath their um, roots because I think they, they, the roots kind of stem out and they can hide underneath there real easily, but they don't hurt the plant as such as, that I have found. Okay, next. 
All right. Okay, so this is a lot of people say, why, why is it not blooming? You know, so we're, there are several reasons for this. Number one, you might have a tiny plant. You know, you might have a little cutting or something. It takes us a while to get growing. You know, it's a, maybe you have planted your plant in way too much deep shade, not high shade, but deep shade where it gets no, not even little bits of sun coming down through it. But the most important thing is that you have pruned it incorrectly. And so <clears throat> we'll be talking about how to prune a plant in just a moment. So the next slide, please. Okay, so when to prune old versus new wood, etc. Okay, so the macrophylla and of course folium blooms on old wood. So you should prune those after they bloom. And that means before August 1st. Now, quite honestly, I, I have so many hydrangeas that I start pruning them in um, June, um, excuse me, July 15th. That's really my cutoff time. I start then, and but I do not prune very much now. I, if I have a piece that is, um, you know, too tall or sticking out, or maybe I need some more space around it, I'll prune then. But um, those, and I, so if I prune it in July, it's still going to grow, see, through that summer. And, and so you're going to have some new growth for the next year for it to bloom on. The paniculatus and the aberrancens. Okay, so paniculatus can be pruned in February. That's the best time to prune them. Now, <clears throat> there's two different ideas about pruning a paniculata. Some people are very severe and cut it back to like six inches. I never do that. <clears throat> I did that one time and I regretted it tremendously. They just need to be, I, in my opinion, I'm telling you from experience also on this, that you need to shape them, prune them so that they're shaped, take any kind of dead wood out of them, of course, but you'll see that dead wood in um, the year, you know, the, this, like this time of year, you'll see dead wood within that. So you want to keep them shaped. Now, if you, um, an ab, um, uh, the arbor, arborescence, okay, that is like the Annabelle. Okay, so the Annabelle, the Incredible, those types of hydrangeas, those need to be pruned in the same time, like February, January, February, when it's winter. You go out and you can prune those. Now, again, some people prune that ab, uh, the Annabelle down to like six inches. If you do, you're going to have all of this new growth that's going to come out. And the problem being is that it's going to be even more loose and floppy, if you want to call it that way, than it would be if you prune it to about 12 to 15 inches. Now, I have learned this through experience and also through doing investigations on this. So the, 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 if you think about it, 12 inches up, then you're going to have another, like, say, 20 inches coming up on top of that for your plant and it's just stronger. The bottom is stronger to support it. Um, the Serrata, which is like the Preziosa, tiny stuff stuff, um, you prune those as soon as they finish blooming, just like you would um, um, anything else. Okay, now, okay, so I, I, I could not get out into my garden. I am so sorry that I didn't. I was going to bring in a, an example to show you on this, but um, you can propagate, and which I have been working so much this last week in my garden on hydrangeas, but the easiest way to propagate is to take one of the limbs that is a large, large limb and see if you can gently pull it down to the ground. You scrape off the back of the stem slightly, just slightly, until you see some green, and lay it down with some soil, make a little trench, lay that stem down, put a, put a little bit of soil over it, put a brick, stone, anything on top of it to hold it down into the ground, and then it'll take it about six months to um, root on top of that. Then after that period of time, you can cut it from the mother plant and you, it's like an umbilical cord, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and just, and then leave it in the ground, though. So if I were to be doing that, let's say, um, earlier in the year, I would have a nice thriving plant by next year. 
and I could pick it up and put it in a pot or I could move it to another area. All right, um, so a cutting, when you do a cutting, you take about a six inch piece of green stem and you, you, you will see little bud areas where there could be leaves. You st or, or there are full of leaves. So you want to strip all of the leaves off of that stem, except for two at the top. Cut those two limbs, in, those two uh, leaves in half, horizontally, not vertically, but horizontally across. Then take a um, rutone and put it over the bottom and put it in a uh, small pot and um, then you know, I put mine, I keep my water, my garden watered fairly well, but I put mine underneath a shady area, like underneath another plant or, you know, in the shade out in the backyard. And um, then, then within, you know, a while, you're going to get another plant. But I would say at least six weeks, eight weeks, you're going to get a tiny little stem that's going to have roots on it. That does not mean that that plant is going to bloom the next year. And you really have to nurture those small plants as you go along because they're not strong enough a lot of times to withstand a big freeze that we might have. So you really have to protect those, okay? So, all right, so now I don't know if we have enough time. We're almost down to the end of this period of time. So maybe we should just skip this section here and um, go with questions, okay? So, okay. I'm open. Thank you so much, Linda. So if anybody wants to go ahead and address any questions to Linda, please unmute your phone and you can either ask her directly at this time or um, otherwise you can put that in the chat window and we'll address them there. Um, we did have a question from one of our board members. Um, he was wondering where you can find the Incredibles uh, type of hydrangea. Well, you know, pretty much they, at any um, nursery. I mean, they when when the um, the the season is on, you know, you can find those like Scottsdale Farms, Buck Jones. Um, you know, any good nursery is going to have those in in that period of time. So I would say in May probably that's when most people start seeing hydrangeas begin to get buds on them and then the nurseries will have them all shipped in and by June when they're blooming blooming because that's when the hydrangea tour is is in June and that's when their big peak is right in June so I, any place I you know you have to be careful when you do online um, it just depends upon your vendor I, I found I have had really really good luck with cutting edge of doing um, Wilkerson Mill is an extremely good per, uh, group to send plants to you. And I'm sure that you can find an incredible down there. Um, but you have to be careful with places like, um, let's say Wayside Gardening. And I, I'm not trying to criticize them because I know that, but they will, you pay a lot of money for a tiny little plant of being like six inches tall. So, you know, it's kind of disappointing when you pay $30 for something that's six inches tall and you have to wait until it gets larger. So there are other ways that you can get a bigger plant for the same price, okay? Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience today? and be sure to unmute your okay, phone. Yeah. Is, is it a good time? Yes, it is. I mean, to move a plant right now, you can, because I have been doing that this week. That is exactly what I have been doing. Uh, I had some plants that I thought just weren't real happy where they were, and I wanted to pick them up. And instead of necessarily putting them into a different area, I put them, they were small. They, they're little lower plants let's put it this way and so I put them into large pots um, just like black pots you know that you would get in a nursery but they were larger uh, it's something to fit the size of the, the plant you know the root system in there and I was going to baby them along a little bit <clears throat> and then I have moved plants I had a um, penny mag a mini penny rather that was growing under a merit's beauty and it wasn't blooming because it couldn't breathe. It was just, you know, too much plant there. So I picked it up and I was really kind of worried about it because it looked sort of like 
oh, I'm not real happy after I bloomed it, and I'm mean, after I moved it. But after all these four inches, five inches of rain we've had, I went out today to check on it, and it's just perked up, and it's real happy right now. So. Only thing I can say to you is that <clears throat> when you get you want to move something, make sure that <clears throat> that you have your soil ready for that plant. When you dig it, you're going to make sure that you've got your bowl ready, you know, that it is wet, and then you have wet your plant that you're moving, and then you put it in there and then wet it really a lot until it can get settled down into that new bed. Uh, don't don't short yourself on soil, okay? Any other questions? Say, so, Gina, this is Kelly. Um, I, I um, not a question, but a comment. Linda, this was fabulous. I took so many notes, oh. and um, I've already Googled Michael Durr. I, oh. I hadn't heard that name before, so thank you for sharing that. Oh. And, and also um, about the flower mix at um, Green Brothers. I'm oh. definitely going to head over there in the next week. Um, I have one more shameless plug, and that is because it just occurred to me as we were talking about this, um, many on this uh, call have uh, already purchased a hydrangea from Friends of Mimosa. That was our selected flower, we, or bush rather, we did um, snowball bushes to honor the 50th anniversary of Earth Day this year. And we were so successful, we sold out, and we had to get more. Um, and we replaced it with Endless Summer. And we have um, three that are left and ready for delivery. And um, while they are not blooming, they were really strong and beautiful um, plants. And um, you can, and um, Candace Curley is on the call. I hope she can confirm. But you can go on our website, and it was a $50 donation in honor of the 50th anniversary. And these were to Linda's um, point. These were actually in three gallon, um, really nice plants in three gallon um, um, gallons and also came with fertilizer to fertilize for two years. So fertilizer pellets. So so shameless plug, if you want a beautiful plant to, to uh, honor Earth Day, we still have three left. So uh, go on our website and, um, and make that purchase. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think I saw somebody else that had a question. I don't know. I, I they it a little popped up there, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's on the bottom here. Um, let's see. Would you bring that small plant oh, that you is. put in the small pot inside before frost and take out and replant in the ground in the spring? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can do that. I think probably it would be better if it's a, like if this small plant that you've taken the. <clears throat> the um, cutting from and then you were going to up the size of the pot the next year and I think that is the better way of doing it sometimes plant even though they look like they're in let's say uh, three quarters of a gallon or a gallon sized pot and they look real healthy sometimes those get lost within your garden you forget about them or you don't know where you put them or you know somebody steps on them so maybe it would be better to put those in a i mean you could put them in just a nice pretty pot and put them someplace in your garden until they get big enough to put into the ground okay okay mm -hmm. Any other questions from our participants? I did want to um, showcase some of the resources that Linda has provided mm -hmm. for us. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about hydrangeas, there are some great links from the American Hydrangea Society, Explore Georgia, as well as other places. It's, and then the mention for the Michael Durr uh, book, mm -hmm. Hydrangeas for American Gardens. Mm -hmm. Well, this has really been an experience for me. I've never done something like this, so I, I've appreciated it, and I, it wasn't quite as intimidating as I thought it might be. But <laughs> <laughs> no, you've been absolutely wonderful, and a true joy to be, um, you know, presenting with us. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, well, we, there are future classes at the North Fulton Master Gardeners Club, and we actually have one with um, Mimosa Hall as well. We have another topic on the 24th of this month for shade gardening, so stay tuned for that. You can also sign up for that class um, on Eventbrite as well. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Linda. Everybody. It's a great presentation. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. See you again soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linda. All right. You're welcome. Thank you for helping me through this. Okay. Absolutely. We hope to have you.